Hey, good morning, team. Chemistry Coach coming at you again. We are heading into a new direction this time. We're going to start, we've been spending a lot of time lately on just atoms and atomic properties and trends based on electron configurations, but let's put it all together now. That Now that we can look at, you know, we have a totally different perspective of atoms. Now let's bring those atoms together and there's some kind of force that holds atoms together to create molecules, right? What holds the hydrogen atom to an oxygen atom? Uh, to form that, that OH connection in water, and there's two of those connections, right? What holds the carbon atom to the oxygen atoms and carbon monoxide? That's chemical bonding. So that term bond that we use is just kind of this overarching general term of the forces that hold these atoms together. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time in the next several videos looking at those types of forces, the strengths of those forces, what's going on. So anyway, that's just that term bond. Several different theories or models we're going to be looking at. I'm going to focus mostly on the Lewis theory. That's going to be probably this entire topic, right? We're going to do quite a few videos, probably at least five or six or seven, just on Lewis theory, which I think is the simplest theory, easiest one to understand and apply, but there's exceptions to it. There's some situations that we run into where we're like, well, that theory doesn't work real well. So it's not perfect, but it's great, especially for general chemistry. It works very, very well. We go to more advanced chemistry. Uh, you might need a better model. And then in some much, much later topics, we'll get into valence bond theory with hybridization. Going to be a little more organic focused on that one. So if you had an organic chemistry, you definitely want to know your hybridization. And then uh, molecular orbital theory, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Uh, again, you're going to hit that pretty heavy and organic. So for general chemistry, we're going to focus. That's why I put the stars there on the Lewis theory. And then a little more organic. So we'll do a valence bond theory and a little bit of molecular orbital theory much, much later in a whole different topic. Um, they're a little bit more advanced as far as their theories of bonding. Let's get going with Lewis theory. A lot of uh, Lewis theory we've already sort of talked about. I think it's fairly intuitive, but I know uh, G.N. Lewis was working on it in the early 1900s, you know, around World War I, actually. I don't know exactly World War I, but uh, 1916, 1919, right in that range, uh, along with uh, Irving Langmuir, but uh, it's, it's accredited mostly to G.N. Lewis. That's why it's called the Lewis theory. Um, it's uh, just a few key postulates which we've already talked about. When you think of two atoms coming together, right, that bond is that force that holds the interactions that holds those atoms together. So only two atoms are in one bond. It's like a, you got like a tug of war between just two individuals, okay? And that rope between them, think of that as the bond. So when these two atoms come together, they got these tiny nuclei and then a bunch of, you know, n equals one, n equals two, n equals three electrons. And when they start to overlap, it's the outermost electrons that overlap first, right? Or the valence ones. So those are the ones, that's what Gian Lewis and Langway were saying, is the outermost or valence shell electrons are the ones that determine bonding. So the valence electrons are just VE control the bonding. Now, that's an oversimplification. You get to transition metals, lanthanides, actinides, uh, you know, the inner transition metals or rare earths. There's some exceptions to that. You might get some D electrons and inner electrons going in there. But for most of the bonding we're going to be dealing with, deal just with the main group elements, the S, plus, S block and the P block. And so um, those valence electrons are going to be the main ones that control the bonding. And the driving force for this, which we've already talked about, is each atom in the bond, the reason they bond is because separately, right, they're at some energy. Together, they create a lower energy situation, so nature wants to go there. So this atom, atom number one, I would like to have a full valence shell, right, a complete valence shell. That's the most stable electron configuration, just like the nearest noble gas. And atom number two goes, well, I'd also like to have a full valence shell, just like the nearest noble gas. That's the most stable. Well, I don't have it by itself, and I don't have it by itself, but if we get together, maybe we can beg, borrow, or steal electrons so that both of us achieve a noble gas electron configuration. Ho, 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 which for the main group elements and stuff is the S plot, two in the S block, and, you know, because you got one S orbital and three P orbitals, two electrons each is six, six plus two is eight. So that seems to be the most stable configuration. So we call that the octet rule. The exception to that would be, let me get my periodic table, anything in N equals one, because there's no P orbitals. So for hydrogen to helium, that's the duet rule, right? Everything else would be the octet rule as a generalization. So that's the, the goal, that's the purpose, to get eight electrons. Well, there's two ways they can do this, right? 
Either I can take your electrons, so here's atom number one, here's atom number two, I'll steal yours, right? Hey, I need two more, so I'm gonna steal two from you. Ha <laughs> ha, I took your lunch money, all right? What was that? I drink your milkshake. <laughs> so I, I don't think I did that quite right. Um, that's an ionic bond. So if there's a stealing or taking or transferring of electrons, usually from a metal and a non-metal, the non-metal steals electrons from the metal because the metal would like to get rid of a few. Non-metal would like to take a few. So it's like, I need two. You want to get rid of two. I'll take your two. Well, we're both happy. Now you're a cation anion. I'm an anion. It's electrostatic attraction. It's perfect. It's a match made in heaven. But maybe the ones, and that tends to happen more with elements that are on the sides, right? They're closer to the nearest noble gas, so it's easier. But tr remember with ionization energy and electron affinity, I2 is greater than I1, I3 is greater than I2. So uh, taking an electron becomes exponentially harder and harder, and uh, cramming in more electrons becomes harder and harder to do, to the point it's not feasible. So a lot of these elements more towards the center, you know, the pnictogens, a lot of times the carbon, those kinds of things, silicon. They tend, they can form ions, but it takes a tremendous amount of energy. So it's easier for them to just share, right? Hey, we want, hey, you got, hey there, I, there's you and me. We want to get a piece of deep dish pizza, but it costs five bucks. I got $3, you got $2. I can't get it myself. You can't get it yourself. But if we pitch in together, we got five bucks. We can share the deep dish pizza. Woo woo, right? So it's the same thing here. Maybe these two atoms, atoms one and two, Maybe it's like, oh, I'd, I don't have quite have eight. I don't have quite have eight. But if we share a few, if we share a few and we both count those shared ones for each other, we could get a total of eight. That's called covalent bonding. I think it was Langmuir that actually came up with that term. So when they share valence electrons, that's a covalent bond. And most of Lewis theory, we're going to apply to covalent bonding. All right. But we could also do it as far as transferring electrons with ionic bonding. We'll briefly touch on that. We got some terms we need to get into. All right, real quick, the way we're going to do this, you know, how do we represent all those electrons and the elements? We put them together. Well, we call them Lewis symbols. And what the Lewis symbol is, what Lewis said a Lewis symbol is, is we take the element symbol, right? So whatever it is from the periodic table, you know, take that symbol. That symbol is going to represent the nucleus, right? The atomic nucleus and all of the inner electrons, all the core electrons. That's what that symbol will represent. And then we're going to take the valence electrons and represent those with little dots, right? So sometimes they're called electron dot structures or atomic dot structures or Lewis symbols. Yeah, you'll hear all these different things called. Um, and we'll do, we'll practice a bunch. There's some cool stuff you can predict some chemistry that you can generically, it's not perfect, but you can generically predict some chemistry from uh, some of these Lewis symbols or atomic dot structures. Now, when you have the symbol, there's essentially four sides, right? You've got the, let's see, from your point of view, you've got the left side here, the right side here, the top and the bottom, right? So four sides that we can put electrons in. And remember, the goal is to get eight, so we can put a total of eight, up to eight electrons around there. So you just count the number of valence electrons and start putting them in there, right, left, and they tend to go on opposite sides, right, then left, then top, then bottom. It doesn't matter. You could go top, then bottom, right, then left. But if you start on the top, next one would be bottom, go for symmetry. If you start with the left, then go to the right, and you just do it up from, obviously, zero valence electrons, which is kind of weird. So we'll start with one up to eight. Now, how many valence electrons? You should, you could do the electron configuration and figure it out. But the reason I like the older numbering system, where you have the 1A for the alkali metals, the 2A, and this is the B block, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, 8A. That's why if you need to review the video on periodic tables, I do that. Versus the 1 through 18, which is the modern IUPAC one you lose track of the nice little shortcut where if you use the A and B block ones, the number of valence electrons is equal to group number. So all of the group 1A have one valence electrons. Everything in group 2A have two. Everything in group A has three. Group 4A, like carbon silicon, have four valence electrons. Nitrogen, phosphorus, all the panictogens have five. All the chalcogens, oxygen, sulfur, selenium have six. I can't do that with one hand. All the halogens, or group 7A, have seven. And all the noble gases have eight. Octet rule, stable. That's why they try, don't tend, tend not to react. So number of valence electrons is equal to the group number if you're using the A, B system right on and we're gonna be we're not gonna deal with transition metals at this level so group 2a is 2 6a is 6 easy peasy right let's draw a few and show you what we can predict from those 
All right, let's play around with these atomic dot symbols, electron dot symbols, Lewis symbols, whatever you want to call them. I don't care. Couple useful, not perfect, but it's a nice little rule of thumb for a lot of main group elements when you're doing simple chemistry. Uh, we've already looked. You can do this from electron configurations. We learn how to predict things from that, number preferred ion charges and whatnot. But we haven't looked at covalent bonds yet. If you look uh, for metals, once you place, draw the atomic dot symbol or the Lewis symbol, and you look at the valence electrons in there, if you see any unpaired ones, because you have four sides, top, bottom, right, and left, up to eight. So you could have uh, two on the left, two on the right, two on the top, two on the bottom. Those are called paired electrons. If you just have a single one there, that's an unpaired electron. You'll see that when we do. I'm going to do hydrogen, magnesium, and nitrogen to kind of show you. So any, for if you have a metal, right, and again, metals being these babies over to the left of the staircase line here. All right, lots of metals. Um, but again, we're not going to do transition metals necessarily at this point. The number of unpaired electrons is the number of valence electrons they want to lose, creating hopefully a noble gas core shell. Well, that'd be the preferred cation charge. You can kind of relate that to electron configurations. Although when you do Lewis symbols, you don't worry about orbitals, right? They just You just place them in a right, left, top, bottom. You don't worry about placing two in an orbital. That's an electron configuration. For nonmetals, right, all these babies to the right of the staircase line, it, once you do the atomic dot symbol, you look at the number of unpaired electrons. That tells you two things. Is that non-metal? We're going to assume metals always form ionic bonds at this point. Not true in the real world, but at this point for this class, that would be true. For non-metals forming, reacting with a metal, forming an ionic compound, the number of unpaired electrons would be the preferred anion charge. Preferred, right? There's exceptions to it. If it's bonding to another non-metal, they're going to share electrons and form a covalent bond. Well, we can predict the number of preferred covalent bonds to achieve uh, an octet, right? So the number of unpaired electrons is the preferred number of covalent bonds, and we have to talk about the number of covalent bonds. And I'll show you shortcuts when you look on the periodic table. So let's do these three. So we look at hydrogen, right? Well, hydrogen only has one electron. It has no core electrons there. So we just draw a single dot there. That's it, all right? Well, if we look at hydrogen, well, if it's acting as a non-metal, say it's going to form, you know, uh, you know, a bond with carbon, part of methane, or it's going to react with uh, oxygen and form the bonds in water. Well, it's got one pair, unpaired electron, so it prefers one covalent bond, right? And the goal is to become like helium, right? So it's called the duet rule. Oh, here you go, kitty. If it reacts with a metal to form an ionic bond in that scenario, well, it has one paired electron, so it can form a minus one charge. It's called hydride. It could also um, uh, lose, a, lose another one to become H+. plus. So it's kind of interesting. So it has one valence electron that goes in there. So it prefers one covalent bond. And we'll draw those covalent, covalent bonds as well. It can also form H plus if it loses that one, right? Acting like a metal. Or H minus if it gains one to form the duet rule. In that scenario, and we don't see that as much, like a hydride. You'll just talk about metal hydrides and stuff. Well, let's do magnesium. So you look at magnesium, that's an alkaline earth metal. So it's got two, group 2A, it's got two valence electrons. So we'll go one, two. And you can go top, bottom, right or left, it doesn't matter to me. So this has two valence electrons. And they're both unpaired. Do you see that? They're not paired up here. So that, and since that's a metal, so that prefers... A plus two cation charge. Nothing really new here for you guys. You can do this from uh, easily from electron configurations, but this is kind of a shortcut to an electron configuration. Nitrogen's a little trickier. Nitrogen's in group 5A, panictogen, so it has five valence electrons. Well, let's do five. So there's one. If I start on the right, then I'm going to go left for two. Look for symmetry. Now, before I pair them up, I'm going to go top and bottom. I have the four sides, so this will be three. And now I'm going to go to the bottom for four. So I put my four dots on there. Now, since I only have, I have more than four valence electrons, i got to start pairing them up. So 
So this will be five. Do you see that? So these are paired. And these are unpaired. Right there, there, and there. So nitrogen has two paired electrons and three unpaired electrons. So based on what we wrote up here as an overgeneralization, what could we say? Well, we could say since it has three unpaired valence electrons on the atomic dot structure, or Lewis symbol, and since it's a nonmetal, um, in this case, if it forms an anion, it'd be a negative three. That'd be the nitride ion, like sodium nitride or something. Or if it did a covalent bond, it would want three bonds. It's pretty straightforward, so you can just practice it with all the different elements. The shortcut is, if you just look at the periodic table, right? If it's got seven electrons and it wants to like take three to become like neon, it forms a minus three charge. We learned that earlier. But when we're forming a covalent bond, it's three away from neon, so that'd be three covalent bonds. So for example, carbon would want, if it's forming a covalent bond, one, two, three, four, it would want four bonds. Fluorine and all the halogens would want one covalent bond. Oxygen and all the chalcogens would want two covalent bonds. Noble gases don't want any. They're already there. And if they form anions, you just count over. These form negative one, negative two, negative three. Carbide would be negative four. Very, very easy to do. So you don't really need the Lewis symbol to do this. You can just predict it from the periodic table. But we're going to represent these. And then when we form a bond, just stick them together. So if I'm going to take hydrogen... I could stick, see that one electron there? I could stick a hydrogen and put that electron here, another one there, and another one there. So the nitrogen wants to react with three hydrogens to complete its octet. Oh, let's do that on the next page. Next page, next board. All right, team, so when we're doing ion, let's do ionic bonding first and then show you how we do kind of a, you know, the, use the Lewis, dot, Lewis symbols for that, and then we'll do covalent one, and then we'll do a whole separate video specifically for covalent bonding. Say hi to Griffin. Hello, bearded dragon Griffin. He's just hanging out. Don't go poop. Huge poops, oh my God. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, when it's ionic bonding, remember that's a transfer of electrons. So the metal's giving them to the non-metal so they can both achieve a noble gas electron configuration, right? Or eight electrons uh, in that outer shell. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to represent that transfer of electrons like, with brackets. So like the anion has taken them away from the uh, from the from the cation, right, or the uh, the nonmetal from the metal. So we'll put brackets around the nonmetal with its eight electrons there, ultimately, and then the nonmetal will have none because it lost them all. And we'll put sometimes you'll put brackets around the nonmetal, sometimes you don't, uh, with its positive charge and then the negative charge of the anion. So we can do potassium with bromine and sodium with sulfur. So what I want you to do is do the atomic dot structures for potassium, bromine, sodium, and sulfur. And then hopefully you can see how these puppies connect together. So right, it's pretty straightforward. So let's take potassium here. Now potassium, of course, is an alkali metal. It's right there. It's only got, it's in group 1A. It has one valence electron. So, boop. Well, that's easy, isn't it? Uh, bromine is a halogen. You see bromine way over here? Ba, 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 ba. Group 7A. So bromine has seven valence electrons. So let's put those seven valence electrons in. You ready? So we've got one, two, three, four. Keep them separated, but now we got to pair them up. Four, five, six. Seven. It doesn't matter which side you put them on. Just try to keep it symmetric. But can you see the, the beautifulness? Beautifulness? That's not a word. If that electron of the potassium is to... Ow, he's scratching me. If that electron from potassium is stolen by the bromine, that bromine becomes a negative one charge. Potassium becomes a positive one charge. Right on. So what we can do is draw the new compound here, and I'll keep them the same color. So now let's put the potassium, and sometimes I'll put the cation in brackets, sometimes I don't. I don't think it's necessary, 
um, because it doesn't have any valence electrons there. And now let's draw the bromine, which has taken the electron. And now I usually just do it as the same color. You're welcome to do it as a different color if you want to. It, they're all the, you know, once that bromine gets it, it doesn't care. All the electrons are the same. It's not like this is an electron from potassium and this is an electron from bromine. Electron's a fundamental particle. It's just an electron. It doesn't matter where it came from. So I just usually do them all the same color. But you see the bromine has taken all of those electrons, boom, and the potassium. And so that would be the formula unit of potassium bromide. It actually is alternating potassium bromide, potassium bromide in three dimensions to form a, a cube, like a cube lattice or something. Well, let's do the same thing for sodium sulfide. Sodium, again, is an alkali metal. So sodium's gonna, it's group 1A, so that has one valence electron. So let's pop that there, just like potassium. But sulfur is a chalcogen right over here, so that's group 6A, so sulfur has six valence electrons. Let me find, where'd my green go? I can't find my green. Where did my green go? Oh no. I'm going to have to pause this and see if I can find my green pen, and I'm, I'll go put Griffin back. Yay, the green pen hath been found. It was underneath my periodic table. And little Griffin, that was a little awkward. I'm like, okay, hang on, bearded dragon. So many pets. When you have so many kids, you get so many pets. It just happens. All right, so sulfur was a chalcogen with six valence electrons. So let's go one, two, three, four, right? And now we'll pair them up. Five. Six. I kind of try to pair them up so that it's pretty obvious what happens. So if we do this, sulfur is missing two. You see that? It's got two unpaired electrons, so it wants to form a negative two charge or form two covalent bonds. But since that's a metal, it's gonna it wants to pick up one to fill that spot and one to pair that one up, and that would give it eight. So, but sodium only has one. You see that? Yeah. So how do we remedy this situation? We need another sodium, right? So let's draw another sodium here. Put a plus sign there. Let's put another sodium here, but let's put its one valence electron there. Boop. It's perfect! You can see why you need two sodiums, two plus one sodiums, to balance out a negative two sulfur sulfide. And so we end up with a scenario like this where you got the sulfide in the middle picked up the two electrons right one from this sodium one from that sodium and so we'll draw brackets around that with a negative two charge and then we'll draw sodium on either side like that And like that. Now, some people will just put one sodium there and put a two in front of it. So two and, and a bracket plus. I like to show it on either side where you can kind of see how they come in like that. But, you know, pretty simple. Um, but again, we're going to use Lewis uh, theory uh, and we'll show Lewis structures. When you put the Lewis um, symbols together, it forms a Lewis structure, right? The resulting species for that. We're going to focus, again, mostly on covalent molecules. So let's look at the covalent bonding, and then we'll do another video with all the rules. All right, let's just walk you through the process. Now, remember, covalent bonding, we're going to share electrons. And you can predict the number, a preferred number of covalent bonds, either from the, the period. <laughs> my kids are squealing, from the periodic table or from the uh, Lewis symbol. So nitrogen is a panictogen, right? So that's going to have, that's group 5A, so that has five valence electrons. Let's go one, two, three, four, five, right? So that has five, and three of them are unpaired, and they want to pair up. So it wants to share, now either it will steal three electrons to form an ionic bond for the nitride ion, but in this case, with hydrogen or something else, with another nonmetal, typically it's going to share. Hydrogen, of course, has... One valence electron. Can you see how if they came together and hydrogen put one in and nitrogen put one in, they could both share those two electrons? Oh, but what would that mean? That means that we need two other hydrogens to do this. So if I put another hydrogen here, 
and it shared its electrons. All right, you can kind of think of it this way. They're going to share each other. And then let's put a hydrogen down here. And these will share. So these are going to share electrons. You see why nitrogen reacts with three hydrogens? Because in doing so, you get the nitrogen. And now it had the original five. And now it gets to count each one of those from the hydrogens for eight. And then we put the hydrogen here, hydrogen there, hydrogen there. Do you see that? So now nitrogen has the octet rule. And the hydrogens are the duet rule. So by sharing those electrons with three different hydrogens, both the nitrogen and all three hydrogens have achieved a noble gas electron configuration, which is the most stable form. And that, of course, is stinky, stinky. That's ammonia. That'll wake you up in the morning. Right? And these are called covalent bonds. Right? So can you see how two shared electrons represents, or one pair of electrons? That's called bonding electrons right there. Those are called bonding electrons. Those are bonding electrons or an electron pair, right? A lot of people call that a bonding pair. We have terminology for that. We call that a single bond. Then it turns out you can, you can share more than two electrons in between two atoms. So let's list the different types of covalent bonds you'll run into. And then we'll call it a day for this, and then we'll look heavy into the more specific rules for drawing what we call Lewis structures. Oop, I'm going to unpause that real quick. One last thing. I wanted to separate these bonding electrons from these electrons. See, those electrons here are shared by the nitrogen-hydrogen, shared by nitrogen-hydrogen, shared by nitrogen-hydrogen. But the two up on top of the nitrogen are not shared. So those are called non, there's not a bond there. Those are called non-bonding non electrons or a non-bonding electron pair. You'll commonly, most of the time you hear it as a lone pair. It's, it's alone by itself. It's a lone pair of electrons. All right, let's look at the uh, three main types of covalent bonds you're going to run into. I'm sure you're familiar with these. All right, pretty sure you guys remember this, right? And we already looked at this when we did the ammonia, right? The nitrogen uh, put one in, the hydrogen put one in, and they both, hydrogen got to count, got to count both of those as its um, electrons. So it was the duet rule. The nitrogen got to count both of them. So it had a total of eight at the end. Well, those two shared electrons in between the two nonmetals or one bonding pair is called a single bond. So you can represent that as two electrons, but we get tired of drawing all the stupid dots. So if we have a bonding pair, you can draw that as a line. That line represents, you got to remember, that represents two electrons. So if you lose track of electrons, stay with the electron dots. But if you're okay with the line, that's more traditional. Now, just like if I want to go get a burger, I can get a single patty or I can get two patties or a, a double, <laughs> right? So that'd be four shared electrons or two bonding pairs. That's called a double bond. Ooh, I'm getting hungry now. Right, so the double bond. So four total electrons. It doesn't matter how many came. So three could have come from one atom, one from the other, or two and two, or, or all four from one and zero from the other. That's, that's a special name. We'll put that in another class. But this would look something like this. I'm just using carbon as an example. So you see the two pairs or four total electrons, or we use one line for each bonding pair. So it looks like an equal sign. So a double bond looks like an equal sign. Four total electrons or two bonding pairs. In between two atoms is bonding. And of course, if you want to get three patties or a triple, <laughs> triple bypass, really. OK, anyway. Um, it's the same idea. Well, that would be a triple bond. 
We are not going to do, now I did read one article where a quadruple bond was formed. Yeah, not, not normal. So this is going to be the maximum we'll deal with, single, double, and triple bonds. So if we have six shared electrons, or in this case, three pairs, we would draw the six total electrons. I like to think of them in terms of pairs. Or we could draw three lines. We could draw carbon with three lines. That would be a triple bond. You'll see, not as common, but you'll see that come into place. So let's look at the last one uh, called a coordinate covalent bond and we'll be done. All right, we don't run into these as often, but when they do, it's nice to know what they look like. Coordinate covalent bonds, all right? Now the single bond, right, just two shared electrons. The double bond is four, triple bond is six. Now the double bond, that extra, if you have one line for a single, that extra line is called a multiple bond. So a double bond has one multiple bond. Triple bond is three lines, one for the single, and then those two extra lines are called multiple bonds, so it has two multiple bonds. Just some terminology you'll hear. A coordinate covalent bond looks like a single bond. When all is said and done, you'd look at it and go, that's a single bond, it's a single covalent bond. But how does it form makes it a little bit different. It's when all of the shared electrons come from only one of the atoms. Normally, like with the ammonia, in this case, the nitrogen put in one, the hydrogen put in one, it looked like boop, and so each is sharing one, so they both get two, yay, I'll pitch in three bucks, you pitch in two bucks or whatever, we got five, we can get the pizza. Right? But sometimes, you want to go get that pizza with your friend? I want that deep, that $5 deep dish pizza, but I don't have any money and you have $5. Hey, you know what? Why don't we share your pizza? <laughs> yeah, right. We're still sharing, except you're paying all the money, right? So it's the same situation. If we form, say, a single bond that has two electrons that are shared, but both of those electrons came from one of the atoms, that's not really fair, but they're still shared technically, right? You pay for lunch and I'll eat. I'll eat your lunch too. <laughs> right? So here we've got ammonia, but if we take a proton, H+, plus, that lost its electron, and that comes in there. See that, that lone pair of electrons right there? Well, if the nitrogen says, okay, I'll let you share my all my electrons. We can form a bond, a single bond there. But all the electrons came from the nitrogen. So that's a coordinate covalent bond. All the shared electrons came from the nitrogen. But when all is said and done, it doesn't matter. Because when you look at this species, how would you know which one was the coordinate covalent bond? Ah, see what I'm saying? So they look like just single covalent bonds, but the formation of those. We'll deal with that a lot more when we do transition metal chemistry and complex ions next semester. All right, and since it brought the hydrogen and the plus charge, whoa, kitty, uh, this overall thing will be a plus charge. That's the ammonium ion. So now you see the difference between ammonia and the ammonium ion. Yay!